as this is about incomplete bodies, we are proud to introduce Sheldon Seal, who will be talking about extended bodies. <laughs> so why would you even bother tying an extended fly, extended body on a fly? Why not just use a long shank hook? Well, that, um, there are those that think that a long shank hook in the jaw of a fish, uh, when you pull on the line, you can actually leverage it out. You can actually pop the hook out of it like that. And that's where you saw, you see recently the popularity of flies like an intruder, which has a short shank hook on it, like a little stinger hook more than anything else. And that prevents that leverage, that advantage. Another reason, and the reason that I tie them is that um, I'm not getting any younger. I know it's hard to believe. Um, but I need all the help I can get in detecting a take these days. And with a smaller hook, the fish taking your fly may not feel that hook right away and might hold on to that fly just a little bit longer. And that might give you the chance to recognize that something's eaten it and you can set the hook. Um, I certainly on last Wednesday when I was down there, it, it proved helpful because there are a couple of times when I think I was asleep at the switch, but the fish hung on and that's the key thing. Um, so tonight I'm going to show you uh, four different ways of extending the body of a hook of, of, a, of a fly off of the bend of the hook or off of the shank of the hook in some fashion or another. I'm not going to tie, I'm not particularly trying to tie any specific patterns, but rather I'm going to try and show you some methods. And then you can take those methods and apply them to your own tying and be as creative as you want to be with it. And uh, with a little bit of luck, you'll probably come up with a better pattern and catch a whole lot more fish. And then you can brag about it for the rest of your life, right? And that's what this is all about. Okay, I'm going to switch cameras. <laughs> I've got that working now. Um, this first pattern that we're going to tie, uh, I wrote about this in the Canadian Fly Fisher magazine many years ago. We called it the, the, the B cube nymph, standing for braided butt bead head. Um, it's made with marabou, so it's, it's really very simple to make. And I tie the fly, as you can see, in the round. I don't put a wing case on it or anything. And uh, the reason I do that is because it tumbles through the water a lot anyway. Uh, fish, I don't think, really notice things like that. I don't think they have the acuity to see it. I think the, the key to this pattern is its shape and its action in the water. That uh, back end there will swing around in the, in the little currents and whatnot. And look, they look fairly realistic. So what I will do, this is the, um, this is the large mayfly nymph version. Uh, you use this for when the brown drakes are coming out, when the, and the emergence is going on, uh, the green drakes, uh, the hexagenius, anything like that. Anything that, that includes the nymph that can swim reasonably well, fairly large. You can tie them smaller, but as you do, it just gets that much harder to tie things. Uh, you know what? I was going to do the damselfly version, but I just realized something. That will disappear entirely against this shirt. So I'm going to tie another one of these. Because this is a nymph, I use a fairly heavy wire hook. That just helps get it down a little bit. There we are. You can use a neutral color thread, doesn't really matter. Um, you know, I'm using a tan color here. If you want to, you want to add lead to it here, you can wrap this with a few turns of lead wire and it will um, help get it down even further. But I'm not going to do that for tonight. It's very straightforward. All I'm doing is putting on a little bit, a little um, layer of thread. I'm going to use this is a uh, marabou in 
kind of tan color. And I'm going to, what I usually do is take a couple of feathers. Lay them on top of each other. And now when I go to pull the material off, I've got lots at one go. Just take it, fold it, fold it, pull it off. It's not a delicate process. Trim off all of the uh, curls and whatnot from where it attaches. And I like to tie it on pretty much down the whole hook shank. This stuff compresses very well, so you can get it right on there. So there you go. Nice big bundle of hair on the back there, like of, of marabou on it like that. I'll bring my thread forward just to get it out of the way. Now, the secret to this are these. These are just little electrical clips. We use them as hackle pliers. I'm going to turn my vise just a little bit so that I can get my fingers on this marabou a little easier. And I'm going to start to divide it into three sections. Sounds difficult, but it really isn't. You're going to have a few stray fibers here and there. Don't worry about it. You can break off anything that's a nuisance later on. Take this part now and divide it in half. And you don't have to be absolutely right with it. In fact, sometimes I think it being a little off helps with the action. There you go. You got one, two, three. Now it's just about this point every time I do this that I realize I have forgotten something. I need to be able to tie this off at the end, so I need to get a little bit of thread. And I'll use some red thread that I have sitting right here. Just cut a foot and a half or so off. Foot. Keep that handy where you can find it. We're going to take our material here and you're going to you're going to braid it just like you do hair six or eight times so you get close to the um let that hang there for a second grab your thread get in behind here And you want to wrap it around a couple of times. Try not to catch too much of it. There we go. And then a couple of overhand knots. Right down inside there like that. and trim it with your scissors not too close and take your clips off i think i tied that clip in i did you know there we go all right so there it is now you've got some loose short loose ones on the side you can just Break them off, pinch them off with your thumbnail, anything like that, until you get a fairly compact looking pigtail. That's what it is. You want to take your head cement and you want to put that, or you can use knot sense, anything like that, and you want to put that on the thread. 
I'm going to let that dry while we continue with the rest of the fly. I'm just going to shift that back around a little bit. Okay. And what I typically do on this now is I just make this a, uh, a little partial to seals fur, uh, no pun intended. I just like its reflection in the water. So I will use a little bit of seals fur. Bright orange, you can use brown. Just use something a little darker than the material you're using here now. It's like dubbing a Brillo brush, so it takes a little bit of doing. And just a hen's saddle, pick out a reasonably marked large feather. Hmm. I can see I've picked through this one a lot. There we go, that'll do. Prepare it by just stripping. You want the longer parts. You only need a couple of turns. Tie it in. Trim off the tip. Stroke it back like this. And one or two turns. Just so that uh, this stuff's fine. Maybe I'll give it another half turn here. There we go. Another little trim. Pull everything back under control and just whip finish it off behind the bead. Take your tail. And this one's actually just come on done. <laughs> we'll take that one out of there. I told you I tied in the clip and we'll show you this one. That's the finished fly. All right. You just want to take the, if there's extra, and just pinch it off. You want to pinch off the marabou. Never cut marabou with scissors. It makes too artificial a straight line. You want to just pinch it off with a thumbnail. And there you go. Very simple to fish this fly. I've had great success when the drakes are, are emerging. So the fish are not taking. <laughs> I walked into the east branch of the Delaware one day and it was carpeted with green drakes. There was probably 20 of them in every square meter or more of the water. And, and it was at a pool, a ginormous huge pool and the whole thing was blanketed and not one of those uh, Duns was in any danger of being eaten by a fish, but the fish were feeding on the mergers as it was they were coming up out of the bottom and hitting just at the surface. So everyone was there fishing with a dry fly and not catching anything. I had one of these flies. Never go fishing with one fly, okay? Always have more than one. First two fish took it and I got the fly back. The third fish decided that he was going to keep it. He broke 2x tippet like it was thread. It was an enormous thing. Good. 
this is one of the longer patterns as far as tying is concerned that I have gotten into in the in the last few years. Most of mine, I like to be able to tie at least six and even more if I can in an hour. You know, I, I, but now I find I'm only tying certain patterns anyway. Okay, let's do this one. The secret to it, as I mentioned earlier, is you need a needle. Um, beading needles, uh, milliners, uh, fine diameter needles. These milliner ones are a little stiffer and I find them a little easier to work with. The material that makes the body up, deer hair. You can almost use anything. I've used Antron yarn in a pinch if I didn't have deer hair with me. Uh, all you have to do is just take three or four um, strands of it and wrap it and hold it alongside the, the hook shank and, and you'll see it here in a moment. So I learned a long time ago when putting this needle in to put the point on this side. Don't leave the point out here. <laughs> You'll bleed a lot. Okay, again, I'll use a neutral thread. Um, you want to clip off a fairly large bunch of deer hair. When you first do it, you probably will use too much. And after a few of them, you'll probably get something close to what it should be. This does not need to be stacked. Line it up on here for the length you think you're going to want and a little extra and trim the rest of it off. Take your thread, get a grip on it between the th your thumb and the hair. Put everything down here and make sure it surrounds the hook. And then take a couple of loose turns and flare it. You don't want to, at this point, it will start moving on you. That's all right. This thing will be a pain in the neck to tie until you've got it compressed properly. As you compress it, it starts to behave a little better on the needle. Okay. It's on there fairly tightly now. Take my scissors, trim off, at least on the top here, much of this deer hair at the back. You'll probably also find the end of your thread out there somewhere. You can trim that off too. You don't want to cut the thread, so when you're finished with it, you will be able to clean up uh, the, the ends of it a little bit further. Okay, so now for all intents and purposes, this is the abdomen of your fly. So what are you going to do? Well, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to put some tail on it. This, you can use any kind of barred or, I like to use a barred um, material. This is a uh, coq de lion, but it, you can use um, grizzly or anything. Take a small bundle, tie it on the top here, or what will now be the top of your fly. All right. You're going to dub it, just like you would if it was on the hook shank. I'm using, actually using cat fur, but you could use rabbit dubbing is fine. Now I like to reverse dub this stuff. And by that I mean, 
instead of dubbing from tail to front, I dub from front to tail. The secret to good dubbing is always to keep your noodles as nice and small as you can make them. So that's the top. So I'm going to dub to the rear. This is a big one. Add a little more dub in there. Now the reason I like to dub to the back like this is I can now um, rib it with the thread and that gives the body a little more durability or at least that's the theory. When you get to the front again, stroke everything forward as much as you can and whip finish it off. I made this one very large, much larger than I would normally, just hopefully to help you see it a little easier on the camera. And there we go. It will just pull right off the needle like that. Trim up the hair at the back. Leave the hair at the front. And what you want to do is get your head cement and on the thread at the front. And I also like to put some on the butt end here. You probably couldn't see that. Okay, so there you go. That's what we ended up with. Again, this is much heavier and more robust than I would, um, I would normally use. Let me see if I can grip it with something so you can see it a little better. There we go. Okay, to put it on the hook is simplicity itself. Start your thread. And Mount this right onto the hook shank like that. And with these curved hooks, there's really no right or wrong about it, right? You can make them as long or as short as you want to. With the cook, with the curved hook like this, you'll be surprised how in the end, the whole thing comes out so straight just because of the angle in which it attaches itself. You can clip it up like this and got a few little stray little nubs here that you can just trim right out. And then when you, I typically don't do a whole lot with this now, um, a little dubbing here just to cover the tie-in point. The, um, these things are so big that if you start to try and put wings and things on them, um, they'll twist up your leader, unless you're using 2X leader or something, 2X tippet, it'll, it'll, it'll cause a real ruckus. So I don't really think any of that's all that necessary for the fish anyway, but that's just a personal thing. A lot of people get, I mean, you don't need to put eyeballs and gonads on these things, the fish don't care.
but there are people who like to do that and that's that's fine right that's the nice thing about this sport it can be whatever you want it to be whatever suits your requirements so there we go this is a this makes a by the way this you don't have to put the tail on here but this makes a great grasshopper and again you put a just a little short shank hook in there and the fish takes the whole thing in its mouth and just I find they just hold on to it and you can really give them a good sticking. You just dub it in yellow. That's all. Um, and then, like I said, I would just put a hackle on there. When I do my drinks, I basically do them as a parachute instead of putting real wings on them. I don't use wings on this at all. I will just simply now just dub this, uh, just, just, yeah. just put hackle on it. Hackle pliers, there you are. Lots and lots and lots of hackle. This this floats really well, just the same. Ah, that should do. If you're wondering, that's actually two feathers at the same time there. The only couple of things that I would do next. One is a little head cement, of course. And the other is flip it over, take my scissors, and cut some of that hackle off the bottom a little because I want this to sit right down on the water. Okay, but you see that? And look at this, look. You can actually give the body some shape and it will hold it in the water. So uh, uh, even when you cast it. So it ends up sitting on the water looking very much like the, the, uh, the real animal. They don't sit flat on the water the way our or they don't certainly sit cocked up like this when you put all that hackle in the front and leave it all long. They sit quite low on the water, with the wings up like this, and this helps to imitate that, I, I find, quite well. So there you go. That's good. There it is from the front. I don't know if you can see it all that well. Hang on. Just the, the, the secret to them is when you put that deer hair on there is to, is to truly compress it with the thread. The tighter you can get that, the more compression you can get in it, the more durable it will be. Now, again, this is a little heavy, again, just for the, for the camera so you can see what's going on. Um, I would normally make it, uh, I think I had a sample here, here, now, yeah, here we go. It would come out looking a little sparser, a little thinner, something more along that line, okay? And yes, this is the size. If you've seen the, um, the big hexes and whatnot on the water, they're enormous. Um, if uh, you want the late hex, the one that comes out in August, the back half of August, just use a little bit darker dubbing. Mix something with a little bit of olive in it as well, and uh, it, it'll, it'll work just fine. You can turn this into a spinner, the same style and the same extension like that. Anything like that, spent spinner, works very well. Now we're gonna do something a little different, another extended body, but this time, the extension is made from a feather. Nice. Just a single feather. I like to use a 
It says right on there, wood duck. <laughs> I like to use wood duck only because um, they're very even across the top. They're very even across the top and that makes for a nice tail on, on it. So, so we just take a wood duck feather. Let me make some room. Oh, and by the way, if you go and buy wood duck, uh, it's, it's for the number of feathers you get, effective ones, it's kind of expensive, really. Don't leave them in their package. Take them out, get an old, I'm a, I'm a peanut butter fanatic. Get an old peanut butter jar, clean it out, put them in there. They'll stay, they'll, they'll reopen up and they'll be much easier to put, work with. They'll, they'll go on better for you. Far superior way of doing it. And if you're going to do it for partridge feathers, grouse feathers and whatnot like that, get in there, strip off all the fluff stuff and then store them in a jar like this. Now when you want to use them, it's two seconds worth. I mean, half the time when you go to tie flies, everyone complains about how long it takes for them to do it. But if you watch what they're doing, they're spending all their time getting the materials. If you want to tie a dozen flies, get all the material out, lay it all out, get it all prepped, and when you time the time it takes you to tie just those 12 flies, you'd be surprised how much quicker it is. They're larger than I would normally use for this style. Probably 12 and 14 would be the more common ones, but I'm trying to use something that um, is reasonably visible. I'm not sure how well we're doing, but anyway. Okay. I had a feather. Who ate it? Ah, oh, there it is. Okay. As you can see from this one, I have already stripped off the the soft fluffy parts. What you want to do now is just try and figure out on the stem how long you want your body to be. You want nice well marked barbs. And what you're going to do is you're going to put your thread on. It's always a good start. I'm going to have to just explode this room after this. What a mess it's making. Not too far back. Okay. So now what you're going to do is you're going to carefully stroke the fibers towards the butt. And you want to separate out the part that will be the tail ultimately. Okay, see that there? And the rest of it, you can see is pulled down this way. The idea is Just to pull it down, and as you do, pull it into the sides and form almost like a little bit of a trough of the feather. It takes, it's a little fussy if you want it to look, you know, really classy. Don't be afraid to wrap down the stem with all of this stuff a ways. Gather it all up with your scissors. Cut it off at a slope, at an angle. Like that. Lash it down nice and secure. And to form the tail, this is tricky. Put your finger behind it. Take the point of your scissors. Find this, the shank in the middle there. And as close to the bottom as you can, snip it out. Try and get it even on both sides. And there you have the tail. 
You see that there? All right. Now, if you're really ambitious, I'm never that ambitious. Some, many mayflies have three tails. And of course, you can see this only has two. The good news is they can't count. But if you do want to have three, all you got to do is grab a couple of fibers from each side, pull them in the middle, and use a little head cement, stick them together, and you'll end up with three tails. Okay? I'm not going to do that. Now, again, just a little dubbing to cover the tie end point. Just a little sparse dubbing here. Save that dubbing. I got so much, so little of it left, you know. <laughs> And again, hackle for the, I don't bother again with wings and stuff like that. Just get a hackle on there. Okay, and again, hackle pliers. And again, this is a single feather this time. Very good, there we are. So um, there are some people who actually tie this and they use the leading part to form wings, stand them up and divide them as wings, but I find that to be a lot of work since I don't use the wings very much anyway. And there you go. Very straightforward and simple. Get my hand away from it so you can see it in contrast there. And again, surprisingly durable. You would think that somehow this would be delicate, uh, but, the, but the fish, again, I think because the hook is small, um, the point and where the fish is connected to it is away from the tail end, which is where it would normally be with a long shank. So I think that the flies hold up a little better too. And if um, fly tying is one of those things that you know, you're, you, it's not something you're really, really adept at. Um, the longer your flies can last, the better, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but the beauty of fly tying, of course, is, is that you don't have to be any good at it to enjoy it. And you don't have to be any good at it to actually catch fish with your flies. Trust me. Squirmy wormy. I was using this when I was at the Franklin Club. I've used this on steelhead, on bass. It works for everything. Um, but making it is, um, this is that chenille that if you can melt the end of it with a, 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 a lighter and then it won't unravel. But you've heard, You've seen the mop flies that have come out of recent times, and everyone's really keen on those things. And then everyone's wondering how you make those, those that material. And the truth of the matter is, is it's just regular chenille. But what happens is, is they just twist it back on itself. So I'm going to show you how that's done, if I can find. Ah, here we go. Take the material and you just twist it in your hands until it starts rotating back on itself and you can assist it and there you have it. First we need a hook. 
And you'll see here I'm using a heavier wire down eye hook compared to the ones I was using before. I'll use some red thread. If you have hot pink thread, all the better. And about a third of the way along here, I'm going to start my thread. It's very important to keep it to one layer of thread. I'm going to make the first part of the body. Don't want it too long. Trim it back here a little. And as with all chenille, you want to expose the inner thread. There we go. You want to tie it just on the thread. Tie off. Tie off behind the point here a little bit. Because you're going to cover this space over with a bead in just a second here. All right, take it out of the vise. Take your bead. As you know, beads have a large hole and a small hole. You want to go through the small hole this time. Put it back in the vise. And you want to work that bead forward a little bit to expose the tie-in point. I find by rotating it, twisting it a little bit, you can sort of get it up onto the material fairly easily. When you can see your tie-in point, start your thread again. Do your second part. Trim it to length. Close the core and I'm just really just trying to get like a sixteenth or an eighth of an inch of thread showing here. I don't want very much. Naturally I broke my thumbnail so stripping this which is normally fairly straightforward is taking more effort than normal. Try and get it in there as close as you can Two or three turns is all you want. Tie it off. Now, if you want this thing to stay together even longer, put some super glue in here. But at the very least, you should put some head cement. Okay. And then leave the bead right smack dab in the middle. And that's all there is to it. It's that simple. You can use a heavier bead. You can use two beads, whatever you want. Help sink it. And um, it's just a lot of fun. I was fishing this on a long leader, no indicator. Or I shouldn't say no indicator. I was using a 90 foot indicator because it was a floating line. And um, normally since I'm using an indicator, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to spot when the fish is taking the fly. Wasn't that easy without it. But uh, it, I was amazed how after just a few minutes, you started to develop a sense that something was different about the way that line was in the water. And uh, I was catching fish fairly, fairly easily with it, but it's a lot of fun. You can tie this in orange. I was using orange, I think. Uh, this is a hot pink. Chartreuse will work. Anything like that. Really simple, straightforward, and um, anybody can do it.
Um, going through the internet, I came across, I'm always looking for good loop knots. I came across something called the canoe man loop. Can you see that against my shirt okay? Let me move this. The canoe man loop. You throw a loop behind. Throw a second loop behind. Two loops. Second loop, you push through the first loop. You got that little half moon shape there, right? Take your tag, pass it up through there. And on fly knot line, this thing is not all that easy. Pull it in tight to a loop. And there you have a knot. And if you look at that knot very carefully, you will discover that that's a bowline, which is one of the really good, strong, secure loop knots. So this is just what they call the canoe man loop. It's really just a variation on how to tie the a bowline while also putting a fly on it. So I happen to have a little fly here, all right, <laughs> through there. Throw one loop, throw a second loop, put them th through together, take this, stick it up through the little gap there, and before you know it, once you get the tag out of the way, where are you tag, there you are. Thanks, Sheldon. Thank All right. Thank you, Sheldon. I don't know how long Thank this you, lasts, but I'll be I'll be hanging around for the for the whole thing. Thanks, Sheldon. All right. Ciao. Thanks, Sheldon. That was great. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. Thank you, Sheldon. Thank Pleasure. you. Pleasure. 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 Good job. Thank you, Sheldon. Thank you very much, Thanks, Sheldon. Sheldon. Copy that. Well done. All right. I think I need a drink. <laughs> <laughs>